from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day, making a big difference by doing little things. You're always wanting to give out to your community and show them that they're here and they're loved no matter what their situation may be. We'll take you to where some of Santa's helpers are very busy. As negotiations with China continue, USDA confirms another big buy, U.S. Ag products. And portions of the country dealing with a deep freeze and now more snow. Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado and the all-new Silverado HD, the strongest, most advanced family of Silverados ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Portions of the country caught up in a deep freeze right now in areas such as Minnesota that have been buried with snow recently are getting hit again. We want to begin this morning with meteorologist Cindy Clausen. Cindy, some of this snow is dipping pretty far south. Yeah, Clinton, we had some snow earlier this week, up to three inches in parts of Tennessee, but today's focus is going to be a little further to the north. We're going to be having more snow in parts of the upper Midwest, some of the northern plains. Now, this is the past 24 hours, so we have one storm system that's kind of rolling through the Great Lakes today. You can see that especially Wisconsin, northern lower Michigan, and then it's a one two punch because yet another low will start to come through on Friday. So we're really going to see some pretty decent amounts in especially far eastern Minnesota. But uh, central and into northern Wisconsin are looking at, at least from our model, is showing a good four to eight inches of snow there. So that's going to be a big focus in the north central United States and, of course, the northwest as well. I'll have a lot more on your forecast coming up. Clinton. All right, thanks. Now, it was rumored and on Wednesday it was confirmed. USDA reporting China purchased 585,000 metric tons of soybeans. In addition, he reported another 140,000 metric tons to unknown destinations. Also unknown, whether the U.S. will halt a plan to put new tariffs on China on Sunday. An analyst with CNBC is predicting an announcement on a possible phase one trade deal with China will come before then. But Farm Journal Washington correspondent Jim Wiesmeyer reporting both countries are signaling the negotiations could be extended beyond this Sunday. That's when President Trump initially threatened to invoke sanctions on around $160 billion worth of Chinese products. National Economic Council Director Larry Kudlow saying removal of some existing tariffs is part of the discussion with Chinese officials over that phase one deal. Wiesmeyer saying the biggest hurdle in those negotiations continues to be the U.S. insistence that China guarantee to buy a specific amount of U.S. farm products. Now China wants to link the size of any upfront commitments to buy to how much tariff relief the U.S. would be willing to extend immediately. The China thing is, of course, a lot more important. I mean, it's such a tremendous uh, portion or, or has the potential to be such a tremendous portion of our soybean demand. And um, for the moment, it looks like they're not going to, the U.S. is not going to add these tariffs on Sunday, which uh, is, is probably best case scenario here today. Now, does this mean that we're going to get to a deal? Does it mean that, that China is going to buy a whole bunch of beans between now and South American harvest? Uh, they're going to buy some beans, but... Is it going to be enough to really elevate the market or elevate the prices? I, I don't know if I'd go that far. There's now agreement all around on USMCA. So when will there be a vote in the U.S. on that deal? The House, it's expected to vote on it next week before Congress recesses for the holidays. But Senate Republican Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says the bill will come up after President Trump impeachment trial is finished in the Senate. That means it won't vote on USMCA until early next year. Here's a refresher on what USMCA means for agriculture. First, America's dairy farmers will have expanded market opportunities in Canada for a wide variety of dairy products. In exchange, Canada has agreed to eliminate the Class 6 and 7 milk pricing programs. The agreement specifically addresses agricultural biotechnology, including new technologies such as gene editing to support innovation. U.S. poultry producers will have expanded access to Canada for chicken, turkey, and eggs. And Canada agrees to terminate its wheat grading system, which could enable growers to be more competitive here in the U.S. The USDA says it is extending the sign-up period for dairy margin coverage and for the market facilitation program. It says it's doing it due to the prolonged and extensive impact weather has had on producers this year. The Dairy Margin Coverage Program was authorized under the 2018 Farm Bill. It provides producers price protection when the difference between the all-milk price and the average feed cost 
falls below a certain dollar amount. MFP is money announced by the president to help farmers hit hard by the trade war with China. The deadline for both programs now Friday, December 20th. How big of a difference have trade aid payments made to your bottom line? A closer look at its impact coming up and later spreading a little holiday cheer in Tennessee in an effort to make several lives a little easier later in the country. Walmart may have a new option to get groceries right to your front door. It's announcing a pilot program with self-driving vehicle company Neuro. The program will be based out of Houston. Company officials saying in a news release that they believe this technology is a natural extension of their grocery pickup and delivery service. Kroger has also explored using Neuro autonomous vehicles for grocery delivery, first in Scottsdale, Arizona, and most recently in Houston. That big confirmed buy of U.S. soybeans by the USDA did little to fuel the market on Wednesday. Here's an update from CME. Soybeans did have a pullback. That profit taking is really sending the futures a little bit lower. Uh, last, week, last week's rally did stall finally. I think it's partly because uh, the news that the Brazil crop is on the rise and the fact that the China, the China tariff delay uh, is in the market, but it's already been digested somewhat. And so it just, there wasn't anything else to really continue that engine moving upward. Corn also had a new low, so maybe that was weighing on the soybeans as well. But uh, there's just no fresh news for corn, and that's like helping the downtrend uh, to continue. It's got a few traders a little bit worried. But since September, uh, that's where the, new, the lows were, so we're getting back to that number. Uh, the delayed nature of the harvest you know, really won't reveal any of its numbers until spring. So with that kind of lack of uh, information, that kind of uh, makes it difficult for the market to really move to the upside. And without more uh, demand for, uh, for any of the corn, I think that we're, we may see that uh, futures could fall even further as we move towards the end of the year. Wheat was also lower, so that's adding to it as well. I think uh, we at one point was down almost seven cents. As USDA debates another round of trade aid for America's farmers, analysts are crunching the numbers on what this year's payments have meant for the balance sheet. Here's more from Farm Journal's Tyne Morgan from our Kansas City studios. Here now with Scott Brown of the University of Missouri and Scott recently FAPRI, Pat Westhoff and some of the, the, the folks at FAPRI put out an estimate and said the trade war has cost producers 78 cents per bushel when it comes to soybeans. Now that seems like a big difference from what we saw USDA come out with. So were there different metrics that were used to come up with this estimate or lay the groundwork of how FAPRI came up with the 78 cents? Yes, I think it's important to lay out the assumption differences that took place between the two estimates. In the case of FAPRI, they were looking at not only what was the effect of the tariffs on China, but then also the indirect effects. So other countries that might have increased trade with us in soybeans as a result. Whereas USDA's estimate, but to the best of my knowledge, only looks at what's the direct effect of the tariff in, in China. And we're having USDA come out with some estimates at net, net farm income this year. And 2019's net farm income looks, looks like it could be better than 2018. Some arguing with that. But do you think that actually could be the case for 2019? I think when you factor in what's going to be $22, $23 billion of government payments this year, which it's been a number of years since we've been able to say that level of government payments, that's what's really pulling up farm income estimates when you look at USDA's numbers. Anything else? I mean, have we seen a cut in inputs, uh, you know, producers kind of buckling down and better management practices? Is that, I mean, I know MFP is the biggie, but are there other factors that are attributing to higher net farm income? So we are seeing some cuts in expenses, but as always, it's been very difficult to get those expenses to come down. Okay, so then 2020. Let's say that we do have a deal with China. Let's just say that we don't see the next round of MFP. It's going to be really hard to go cold turkey when you've had these payments that have at least maybe got you to break even or above break even in some cases. So what impact could that have on net farm income in 2020? Yeah, so we, especially with a good crop in the bin, let's say we plant a lot of corn and soybeans next spring. We put a good crop in the bin. We likely end up with lower crop prices, even with the reduction in in tariffs that could take place. So we could talk about 2020 farm income that's lower again relative to the 2019 estimate by USDA, especially without MFP payments. So 2020 might not look like a, a, a great year given where we sit today, 
there's just a lot of factors left at play. We're a long ways from a 2020 crop in the bin, and we're a long ways from deciding whether MFP continues. But I certainly think producers need to be paying attention that it could get tougher in 2020. I think it's just been such a tough year as far as weather and some of those things go, Scott. In the spring, I, I, I wouldn't have imagined that we would be having this conversation now. This winter. I, I think when you look back at 2019, it's like anything that could have gone wrong went wrong. It's, it's one of the hardest years that we've probably ever seen in, in recent memory. And, and so let's hope 2020 is a little easier in that regard of at least getting the production side of this uh, in, in better shape. But you look at where we sit today, rivers are really high. Uh, got a lot of moisture in many parts of the country. What's that really mean when we get to planting next spring? All right, Scott, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We need to take a quick break and then we'll check up, have a check of weather right here on Ag Day. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. All right, take a look at this. Smoke from bushfires surrounding Sydney has caused air pollution to rate 11 times worse than the typical hazardous level. The fires causing a thick blanket of haze to settle around the city. Offices, including Sydney's law courts, were evacuated due to all the smoke, and they're warning people the smoke could set off smoke alarms. Sydney, really dry, a uh, multi multiple year drought happening in Australia, but. Yep. You know, parts of our country getting a little more precipitation this week. Yeah, you know, we've had some wet weather in the southeast this week. We talked about the snow that we had mm -hmm. in parts there. They're going to be seeing some more as well, but we're also going to be seeing more of the cold stuff, more of the white stuff in northern areas as well. As we start off today, we'll be on the quieter side in the southeast, but we're going to see some more moisture coming in and a low eventually tomorrow. So where we need to focus today is with the low pressure system in the upper Midwest that's going to be moving through the Great Lakes and also some fairly unsettled weather in the northwest rain and upper elevation snow there putting this in motion you see that snow moving through the Great Lakes but here's that second system that's going to be the number two in the one two punch and that's going to be moving through the northern plains and into the upper Midwest as we get into Thursday night and on into Friday notice that moisture starting to increase in the southeast as a low starts to move northward through the Gulf so you might have another round of maybe some frozen precipitation especially in those higher elevations in the southeast notice the low starting to move towards the northeast. You've got more snow moving into Minnesota and of course continued unsettled weather in parts of the northwest. Heading through our Friday, that rain really picks up in the southeast as that low starts to move into parts of Florida and Georgia. Low in the northeast, you've got more snow now in Wisconsin and continued rain and upper elevation snow in the west. Now over the past 24 hours, the liquid amounts have been uh, mostly in Florida and into the far northwestern part of the country. But add on the next 24 hours, we really add a lot of moisture to the northwest and into the southeast. We're going to have a lot of moisture, uh, good, mo nice gulf moisture there coming through the southeast. And as far as snowfall, the bulk of it, the heaviest amounts, are going to be in those higher elevations in the west. But as I mentioned earlier, we could be seeing a good four to eight in parts of Wisconsin as well, perhaps even higher in some spots. Again, this is just one model. All right, let's look at those temperatures. Slightly warmer, but still pretty chilly in the North Central United States, 50s down south, and we have some even some teens though into parts of the far northeast. Overnight we go, we'll see those temperatures uh, again slightly warmer even in the overnight hours, but that's still pretty chilly for even this time of the year. And getting into tomorrow, we're going to be seeing those 60s start to surge up into the plains there, at least into the, the southern plains, but we're still going to be on the cool side in a lot of the eastern part of the country. Quick look at that jet stream, and we're going to see that colder air kind of exiting the east. But what's going to happen is another trough builds in for the weekend. So look for some cooler air coming back into play. Another secondary trough for the early part of next week. That's going to bring some colder air once again. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check out the weather where you live. Alto, New Mexico, mostly sunny today with a high of 51 degrees. Greenwood, Wisconsin, snow is likely slightly warmer with a high of 23. And Berryville, Virginia, mostly sunny and cooler with a high of 36 degrees. What does the future look like for beef in 2020? Well, we could see an industry shift coming up, plus one fast foods effort to attract young farmers next in our Drover's Report.
The new World Agricultural Supply and Demand Report projects domestic beef supplies will decline next year. Currently, USDA expecting beef production to be up 1.4 percent. It says that would be offset by increasing beef exports next year. Imports are expected to decline by 166 million pounds. It also expects beef consumption to decline by 7 tenths of a percent. We should note that most private analysts also expect beef imports to be down about 1 percent next year and much of that decline is a direct result of African swine fever in China that has forced the Chinese to seek additional protein imports. Next year analysts believe a surge of beef shipments to China from Australia and New Zealand will cause a dip in those imports to the United States. Drover says that could lead to an increase in prices for slaughtered cows and bulls in the U.S. and could drive another year of increasing cow slaughtered totals. It also says these numbers continue to confirm the expansion phase of the cattle cycle is over. Poland's agriculture minister says he wants to introduce new legislation that would allow military and police to shoot wild boar infected with African swine fever. The announcement comes after the disease appeared in wild boars in the western part of the country. The minister said the law would also punish anyone trying to stop the elimination of infected animals. The draft law will be submitted to parliament in the coming weeks. And Chipotle Mexican Grill says it's making a financial commitment to help drive the future of farming for younger generations. The country says it's offering three-year contracts to farmers under 40 years old who meet the chain's food with integrity standards. Now, Chipotle also said it would increase its local sourcing next year and fund seed grants to support young farmers. Chipotle's CEO saying, quote, farmers committed to farming in a sustainable and ethical way need to help to have a chance to succeed, both for the sake of the future of real nutritious food and the communities that rely on those farms, end quote. Santa's elves are very busy this time of year, and some of his helpers are hard at work in Tennessee. See how they're making a difference for people in need. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. This season of giving and cheer often includes heartwarming times of holiday charity. University of Tennessee Extension is involved in organizing a collection for an assisted living facility in one Tennessee community. Charles Denny has more on the spirit behind the gift. Jingle bells, jingle bells. A caring group with just about all ages volunteering. Santa has a satellite workshop this season at the Wilson County UT Extension office. 4-H youth and members of the FCE, or Family and Community Education Club, sort the large collection, getting ready to stuff someone's stocking. You'll find gifts of clothing, toiletries, and everyday things the rest of us might take for granted, but are greatly appreciated by people in need. It's the 14th year for this charitable effort with thousands of items donated. And just helping each other. I love that it's an intergenerational project because it is people from all ages coming together for one common mission. Um, and that's making people have a bright and cheery holiday. 4-H'ers learn the lesson of true gift giving here, finding a need in their hometown and working to help. 4-H, we're here to make the best better. And so by being able to make the best better, you're always wanting to give out to your community and show them that they're here and they're loved no matter what their situation may be. Avery is talking about the gentleman served by the Cedarcroft home in Lebanon. The men here thankful for those thoughtful items that make their lives easier. Here in Lebanon since the 1970s, Cedarcroft helps the mentally challenged, disadvantaged, and homeless. The facility houses more than 130 men and provides them meals and a place to stay. The goal at Cedarcroft is to help men live a more independent life. There's also training and living skills. As for the donations, Cedarcroft administrators say they'll be put to good use. We use some of the donations as Christmas gifts to the residents as well as other donations we get from the community, but for the most part, uh, what we get from them, we use all year long as long as it lasts because people are in need more than just at Christmas time. St. Nick's sleigh makes its delivery, the kids handing off the items, but everyone involved receives a gift here. 
The men at Cedarcroft get things that help boost their confidence, and generous volunteers are grateful they are able to provide, share joy during the holidays. This is Charles Denny reporting. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in, spend part of your day with us. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.